Okay, so I am Mike Taylor. Uh, by day, I'm a software engineer for Index Data, a small privately owned software house. By night, I transform into an associate researcher at the University of Bristol, where I work on uh, sauropod dinosaurs. It's a, a great gig. When I started doing it in uh, about the year 2000, um, it was possible to understand pretty much all the literature that there was in the field, and it's exploded since then. Uh, and it's not unique to that field. We all know that the rate of new research has just become ridiculous. Uh, the STM report for 2015 estimated 2.5 million research papers in 2013, and the output is growing by 3% per year. Now, what is the purpose of all this? It's very easy for us researchers to fall into the, the trap of thinking that the purpose is to get references and to gain promotions and grants and tenure and all those things and forget that actually the reason we do the research is to change the world and let's not please forget this and librarians don't forget this in supporting us that it's about resolving health problems and drought and everything else and we run into two problems all the while in using research papers that are created we know what they are one of them is access the problems imposed by barrier-based publishers the other is discoverability even when we have access to a paper, we may not be able to find that we want it or need it. Now, happily, for this audience, I don't actually need to burn 20 seconds talking about gold and green open access. So you can all just take a quick break, and uh, I'll just draw breath while we let that slide amble past. No, so look, here's the, pro the real problem. Even assuming we have access, where do we find it all? Now, around the world... There are at least 4,000 institutional repositories. That's just the ones registered in RAW. And there are plenty of others that aren't, because some of the ones in Open Door aren't in there, and there'll be others again. No one even knows or is tracking how many publishers there are, especially when you include all the little publishers, you know, scholarly societies that only publish one journal. So how can you find them all? Something like Google Scholar is a helpful tool, but it's not the answer. Its coverage is uneven, it's undocumented, you can't find out what is and isn't there. There's no API, you're explicitly not allowed to screen scrape it. And crucially, like any Google service, like Google Reader, Google Code, Google Wave, it could go away at any moment. So much better answers are existing projects that go some way towards aggregating uh, information, particularly from repositories. Uh, these include PubMed Central in America, uh, Share, also an American thing, uh, Core here in the UK, run by JISC, and Open Air for uh, European-funded projects, uh, all of which are doing great jobs focused in their specific geographical areas. But the issue, of course, is we don't want to search many aggregations but one. We need to aggregate the aggregations. We need to bring them all together in just one place. And then when we have that one big data store, which is what we want to be able to use, we have enormous number of choices in what we can do with that. Uh, we want to make it available freely to download uh, under public domain terms, so you can do what you want with it there. Uh, we provide a web service APIs, uh, and of course, uh, most straightforwardly, uh, just a web user interface. So you want to search it like you would Google Scholar, that's fine, but that's only the tip of the iceberg. How are we going to build this enormous data store? Well, it's a two-pronged strategy. Uh, the first thing we want to do is aggregate the aggregations that already exist. These regional things, they overlap. Together, they cover a lot of what exists. But there's also a very, very long tail of things that are emitted. For example, the many repositories that RAW knows about that don't even have an OEI PMH service. We can bring all of those in. Um, because we're not limited to using OAI. We've got good technology. As I said, we're a software house. Various options, but the, the sort of nuclear option that we can do is just scrape what's on the website, as, for example, we've done with SSRN. Let's get that into a machine-readable form. Now, all of this is very worthy, but you may feel that it's a bit dull. Um, and the reason is, of course, that infrastructure is never sexy. It's never an exciting thing to uh, do bridge maintenance or build a road or whatever you have, which is what this is. But here I would refer you to Ben Goldacre, who's lurking down there, who described this as brilliant, boring, and necessary. And I think that's spot on. Now, so obviously I am excited about it. Why? Because of what can be done with it. Content mining is an obvious uh, application. Another is preservation. Someone like the Internet Archive could use it for that. Enhancing existing search results. Google Scholar could become much better in its coverage if it used our stuff. Similarity searches. Uh, but much more important than any of that, all the ideas we've had of the way this data store can be used, is the ideas that we have not yet had, but which other people will have, 
We are not humble people by nature, but we are humble enough to realise that the other six billion people in the world are likely to have ideas that we haven't had. And those are the ones we really want to see. So the way we're doing this, we're building it bit by bit, rather than eating the whole elephant in one mouthful. We're collaborating with Roshan Khan, who runs Open Access Nepal, a very successful advocacy organisation. And we're going to gather data specifically that's relevant to the country of Nepal, partly as a sort of proof of concept of how we can scale this from one place to another. What's the value of all this? Well, it's incredibly hard to quantify, but conservatively, we think <laughs> that the value of open access uh, to the world has been very, very roughly estimated at 2.2 billion pounds. So if we're missing, say, 10% of that because of the difficulties of discovery, there's a gap of 220 million pounds a year that we can make up with something like the One Repo. It exists, it's there, onerepo.net, please go and play with it. It's small at the moment. It's only harvesting 28 resources. We want 4,000. In fact, more than 4,000. There's a lot of work to be done. And this is where I turn to you. And I want to say, um, can we actually skip back, please, to the third slide? Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> the goal here is to change the world. We are looking not just to make a service available, but to do something that will enable these kinds of crucial innovations that the world needs. We are looking for partners, and by partners I mean people with money, who are going to help us to make this a reality. So I leave you with this slide with my uh, email address. Please get in touch with me. Come and find me later on today. I'm dressed all in black. I have white hair. I look like a pint of Guinness. I'm easy to find. <laughs> and I will use the remainder of my time to take any questions you may have and give the best answers that I can. And uh, I will now open the floor to questions for the remaining time. Thank you. <laughs>